like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years. Flex 7 outer shell fabric delivers a perfectly broken in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 outer shell fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tencatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. Seconds count when responding to an emergency. Minutes save count when documenting your day. Emergency networking makes records management easier and faster with its Fire and EMS solution. User-friendly, complete online and offline functionality, highly customizable, all at an affordable price. For more information, please visit emergencynetworking.com. Fire Service Data and Tech Talk. Hey, everybody. It's Eddie Buchanan with the Fire Service Data and Tech Talk on Fire Engineering. Uh, I'm ex- really excited this week for this show because uh, it's a continuation of a conversation we've been having about data beyond the air break, right? So if we, it's kind of a part two to back uh, a while back when we talked to Assistant Chief Tim Christ. He was talking about uh, data-driven fire operations, which was an article that ran back in June of 2023 on fireengineering.com. And it got a lot of interest in how Phoenix was actually leveraging data to uh, improve operations. Well, fast forward all that after we recorded that show, um, I was at the Arizona Fire Chiefs Conference and started uh, had a conversation uh, with some of the training staff there. And it was really cool because we're, we're standing around the conference hall and uh, just shooting the breeze about the data and the training and, and what are they doing to uh, improve operations through data collection. And we sat there and had a conversation for like an hour. And I told the guys I was chatting with then, I was, I was like, man, we should have recorded that. Dag on. That, that was a really interesting conversation. So fast forward a month or two, and here we are. We are going to record it this time. So um, I'm very honored to have the training staff, a, lot, a, a big representation of the training staff uh, from Phoenix Fire. I've got uh, the director of training, uh, Chief Wes Patterson. Chief, thank you for being here. I've also got uh, Division Chief Jason Miller and Captain Seth Jenners. So, guys, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to uh, come back and shoot the breeze with me on this conversation. And, uh, Chief uh, Patterson, you want to just kind of give us an overview, welcome, and let us know uh, – you know, your perspective on data and training. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thanks for having us, Eddie, number one. Uh, this is a great opportunity. I actually missed that conversation uh, when you were in town because I was on vacation with my family, but um, talked to Jason about that a little bit. And it sounded like a great uh, intro to, to make this happen. So um, I think when you look at data and data analytics in, in fire service, we know that everything revolves around data and, and collecting information. Now we make better decisions. We, we make better policies. We challenge assumptions. Um, you know, we, we challenge our, things that are kind of anecdotal to us that we know, and we're able to either confirm or debunk those things and ultimately make um, our processes better. Um, I think when you look at coming up on the Phoenix Fire Department, I, come, I came on in 1991 and, you know, Chief Bernasini was our chief. And we did a lot of uh, uh, cool things back then, even historically, if you remember the NIST uh, studies we did where we burned the houses and we had the the mannequins on the roofs and we, we looked at, you know, structural collapse. And then after the Brett Tarver uh, su- uh, Southwest supermarkets fire, a lot of recovery drills and a lot of data then. So coming up as a young firefighter and then as a young captain, seeing some of those things um, ingrained the importance of that, but, but obviously, as we moved into to the more modern era, data collection has just become, you know, the norm. You, you've got to look at data. You've got to collect data. And I think bringing that into the training environment is something where we, you know, we see data collection happening everywhere. And so I think it was as a group, it was, you know, Seth and Jason coming. Hey, we need why don't we do this? We had a big department wide drill coming up. Let's collect data. Let's measure some things. And, and so that's kind of how we started down this road. Awesome. Well, thank you for thank you for bringing the staff on. And like I said, it was a great a great conversation we had before, and I, I'm really excited to share what we talked about with everybody else. 
a mental training guy, right? So I spent most of a big old chunk of my uh, time in the fire service at the training academy. So, and, and also very involved with the uh, International Society of Fire Service Instructors. So it's also a, an important uh, concept and topic for them as well. So I appreciate you, you taking the time to be on. Uh, Chief Miller, say hello there, sir. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks. And it was, it was a fantastic conversation. I'm glad we're back and, uh, and going to be able to talk about this more and hopefully share this with, uh, with a lot of people out there. Awesome. Awesome. I appreciate it, man. I, I'm looking forward to it. And I, I, Captain Generous, hey, how are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? Thank you for having us. This is a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, excited to share all the cool things we've been doing over here in the uh, training section of the Phoenix Fire Department. You know, this is thank you very much for, for giving us this platform. Absolutely. And so I guess to kick it off, um, tell us about so our conversation at the exhibit hall was really about we, we had talked about what uh, Chief Christ had, had mentioned in his article, and then you guys took it way deeper. So uh, tell us about the, this particular report we're talking about, this particular drill, and there are others, uh, but, but tell us uh, kind of the gist of how this uh, went and how you put it together and, and the kind of the scope of the drill itself. Whoever would like to address that. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll start it off and then Jason and Seth can jump in. So the scope of the drill overall was, you know, every year we're a big department and, you know, ch uh, training is a challenge. The bigger your department is to keep um, everything going because there's some, such a multitude of things we have to train on. So we only get so many opportunities to do a what we call department wide drill where everybody goes through a hands on, you know, type of drill. So we were able to get a building, commercial building um, through what through a builder that, that we work with and um, vacant. And so we had the opportunity to put to together a drill. We had to have several incidents prior to this, uh, cold smoke incidents, warehouse incidents, where we had firefighters get lost. We had a May Day in Tempe, and we've had a, a number of these throughout our history. So we decided to make that our focus because we have had the opportunity to do it. And as we put that thing together, you know, it was a whole team effort. We, we kind of used a mini IMT, if you will, to sort of structure the, the, um, the logistics and get everything lined up. Um, but basically, once we had that put together, we started talking about this, the collecting data and measuring some things. And that's how we kind of started with, um, you know, the idea to, to look at what we could measure from this drill and what we could take away. And then we had the idea of, of let, we need to put together an action, after action report and get this information out. So that's kind of how it started. And, and Seth, I think you guys, you, you can definitely chime in on, on some of the ideas of, of where we wanted to go with data collection. Yeah, uh, definitely. Jason, did you want to talk about that or do you want me no, to? No, go ahead. If you, if, why don't you jump in and I'll, I'll kind of jump in at the end. You know, it, it was it's one of those things where when you're part of this organization for a long time and you, you look around and, and you just you always wonder, you know, how did we do in this training? What did we learn? And there was never really any, any information that came back to us that kind of reflected upon the, the decisions you made, the, the actions that you did on that drill. And that was the priority. So as we started to discuss what was the goal of this training, it was kind of um, came up where with these tools that we now have in the Phoenix Fire Department to utilize and collect information, how can we leverage those to, to provide information back to everybody? You're gonna have this large sample of information. Well, you talk about um, actions after the parking break. Well, how do, we, how do we know what's good and what's not good and how comparable everybody is together and how can we provide that information to make better decisions? Um, so I, I personally, as a captain, was interested in knowing that myself and, and seeing how I did, the rest of the department did. How long does it take? Is there any advantage with a two inch versus an inch and three quarter? You know, I'm a ladder captain. Is there an advantage between a stick versus a platform? Is there an advantage, you know, to, to doing something inside versus not doing something inside as far as how much air you use? You know, forcible entry. How long does it take overall to, uh, to force entry on one of these blue door props that we utilize, you know, as a common starting point? Um, so I just we I think we really felt like it was an opportunity to start collecting information and and using that. It, we, we didn't know what we were going to get out of it, but it certainly provided us with a lot of insight as to what we are, who we are as an organization and how we can train toward getting better. And, and are these numbers that we're coming up with acceptable? Do we need to challenge them? 
So uh, yeah, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, and, and we were able to put that together in easy collection fashion and then, um, and then build a report. You know, uh, uh, here's another thing that goes into that is how fast do you, do you release that information back out? Is it, is it, is it immediate or close to immediate where it's useful and you, and, and everybody remembers it? Or is it six months out where now it becomes kind of a distant memory and now everybody has to kind of try to remember what happened on that training drill? So these, these tools and this way that we put this together allowed us to, to accomplish a lot of these, these, um, these items. Jason, what do you think? Yeah, and I would jump in there to say, um, you, you know, looking at it from a, from a large scale perspective, some of what we, uh, our perspective in coming into this, because we, we, um, we, we've been testing and, and drawing data on a lot of different things with respect to this particular uh, drill that we had. We we're looking at what people are doing and measuring those, but we have to understand why. And I think what's important when we start uh, in an effort to build this out and understand what, what data do we want to collect, it always is driving towards what would be our true north, um, which is uh, customer service, firefighter safety, and then proficiency with their folks. And so when we start asking, what do we want to measure? We, relative to this drill, we wanted to look at how do we measure the things that if we can understand them better, will allow us to drive towards a higher level of customer service, more proficient and competent firefighters in, in our profession, and ultimately a safer environment for them. And I think this it did that in some really uh, prolific ways. Uh, and Seth touched on it a little bit. We didn't really know, and you never really do know, you shouldn't, uh, because we're not gaming this, this data. You shouldn't really know what you're gonna get from it. But once we started pulling this together, drilling down on it, spending a lot of time trying to understand it, uh, what the byproduct of this was were results that were immediately actionable to the folks in the field to allow them to make better decisions on the fire ground, both firefighters, company officers, and chief officers, um, help them perform more safely with some of the things that came out there were blind spots that we found in this training. And ultimately that leads to a better ability to deliver the customer service that we want to. And so I think that's what our driving factor is in this. We're not just kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what sticks. We really are driving towards understanding how do we do our job better, safer, and provide a better service for the folks out there in our communities. But you know, it, it speaks to where we are as a fire service, right? So uh, one of my buddies, uh, he has a great saying, he's that the, the whole thing that data is to measure what's important. Right. And we're just starting to figure out as a fire service as a whole, what that actually is, right? We, we, I don't know that we really have clarity on what's important on a tactical level. Uh, NIST has been, or UL has been using the uh, term speed to task. Yep. I've noticed they've, they've used that phrase. And uh, like you, I, you know, praising Phoenix for, for being out on the, the front edge of that is to actually being able to articulate what is important in a way that is reflective of your mission. And that, that, that's, that's very, very impressive. Um, and I think everybody listening to this show that's in the fire service should be your fire department should be considering that is to start having conversations about what things are important to measure in an operational capacity. And you're going to start to see that uh, evolve as we start to go into like a new data standard with Neris and, and things that are changing on the broader landscape. Uh, so this is, this is a big topic uh, related to the fire service, not just with Phoenix and not just with where I'm from, but for everybody yeah. that we should all, every, every instructor, every training officer should be uh, wrestling with, with some of these metrics and understanding how to do it. Now I do have a question. Um, how much tech was involved in this data collection? Like how did, how did you, uh, you, you mentioned that it, uh, timeliness was an important factor that we didn't spend, you know, three months counting, slashes on a paper, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how did you collect the data to uh, actually use it in a, in a real time kind of meaningful way? So uh, we'll kick that one to Seth because he built the app that actually we use <laughs> to collect the data. But I'll, I'll say a couple things about it. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the challenges because you have to dedicate personnel that are going to actually, de uh, you know, collect the data. Right. So w when we're running a drill this big with a department as big as we, we are, we already have a lot of subject matter experts and trainers on site every day that are going to accompany our crews on the drill and they're going to be our, our site proctors but we had to dedicate extra personnel 
just to be data collectors. And, and some of the things that were important to us from the beginning was that the consistency in that. So we wanted to train um, a very small pool of specific people that were going to use the app to collect the data so that we had consistent gathering. We didn't have stuff all over the board because otherwise you end up with this dirty data that's not, you know, uh, consistent. So, you know, and it's not scientific, you know, we're, we're not scientists, we're just firefighters doing, doing the best we can. Um, but that's what firefighters do best. They just figure out how to do this stuff. Um, but the, the beauty of doing it in a drill like this is the, is that the consistency of the drill, the site, the layout is pretty much the same every day. What the companies do is up to them. We let them decide what door they're going to take, what line they're going to pull, and we just track it. So we're not telling them exactly what to do, but the, but the functionality of the building and, and the, the assignment, you know, and all those things are pretty consistent. So that's the nice thing about this versus if we tried to collect data off of, you know, different fire grounds, everything is a little bit more dynamic and, and, um, you know, more difficult to collect because of all the variability and something like that. So that was probably what was important to, to us on the front end. Um, but Seth actually built the app so he can speak to the technology piece. Yeah. So to answer the question about the technology, how much tech or IT or, or whatever you want to, however you want to phrase that is involved, um, you know, with the new the new tools that we have available, us, and we were fortunate because we were able to use the Microsoft uh, Power Platform environment, and um, it's not built for fire firefighting, but it's built for data collection and data reporting, data automation, uh, uh, automation, and so. It's it's uh, it's not a lot of technical expertise, but there is a level of investment in the technical side that you have to accomplish. But it's but once you've invested in that, it's the flexibility with the technology that allows you to do everything and collect anything that you want. That's that's most impressive. So, you know, I got to give uh, Microsoft a lot of credit, you know, for that, for making these tools available um, to do these to, to, to achieve these goals, you know, and it's not just in the fire service, they do it for other organizations or these tools are available. Um, but you have the power application environment, which allows you to build these, these data collection points. And then the automation, which is called power automate within there allows that information to get distributed to different areas. And then on the, the, the final part of that is what you have is called the Power BI, which is business intelligence, which for us, it's organizational intelligence, it's training intelligence, how are we doing? So this, this suite of technology together allows you to collect it, you know, clean it, push it to a point, and then the reporting summary, the graphical interfaces, the real-time dashboards, the, the collection and, and, and insight into what you're looking at, um, that's that suite of tools. You know, it's it's not, you know, Microsoft obviously isn't the only one that, that provides these suite of tools. So you could do it with you could do it with Excel. You could do it with a lot of different things. But this this is what we had and, and it worked very well. And it also allows us to be very flexible and change our collection points to to specific uh, items. You know, as, as Chief Patterson pointed out, we wanted to be very very specific and deliberate in what we were collecting and why we were collecting that. Well, these tools allow us to, to go right at those items and report specifically on that. And then Chief Miller will tell you in a second about these qualifiers. So you you add in time on the job or, or where you're located, what battalion, whatever you want to add in there that might dif differentiate different, uh, find differences in the information. You can, you can um, it's not, you know, you can customize it to fit those needs and report on them. So I hope that answered your question. Uh, as far as how much IT, the investment, there is an investment in, in, in IT, but not like you don't need a whole section dedicated, you know, to just this program. It's created for the average person to be able to put it together. This sounds like a firefighter, you know, I don't want to say nerd, but, you know, <laughs> so somebody, somebody with that propensity. Yeah, you, could, I mean, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah could sure, build this yeah. thing in a firehouse. Right? Yep. Yeah, you know. Eddie, you hit on one of the things me. that really important, though, about this is determining what to measure, right? Like, so right. we measure what's important, but there's a lot of different things we can measure. And you, and you could kind of get caught up in the minutia of just all kinds of statistics and data. And then it's like, well, what do you do with all that? So I think that's just one of the really important things if, if you're going to do a drill and collect some data is really spend some time figuring out well, what do we really want to measure and 
how is it going to make us better and how are we going to apply that, you know, to what we do? And, and we, we had a lot of different discussions about, well, should we measure this and that, you know, trying to narrow it down. And, and like I said before, we're not scientists, so we're just firefighters trying to figure it out, but, um, spend some front end time really kind of zoning in on that. And, and I would, and I would say, don't try to do too much. You know, uh, we were very careful to create this thing to where our, our data collectors could keep up with the progression of the drill. Cause if that guy gets buried in, in trying to track all these different things, it's going to turn into a disaster and your, and your data is just going to be, uh, screwed for the, for lack of a better term. So, um, so really, uh, focusing on some important things, um, you know, and, and keeping it kind of simple, I guess, so that so that both the data collectors can really do a good job of keeping track during a live drill. You know, they've got to keep up with that. So th those are those are conversations we had along the way to help kind of create an environment where we could actually collect the data consistently. Our, our uh, trainers could could do that effectively and we would end up with a, a good, you know, data data um, collection. If I could jump in for a second, too, I think speaking to that point, one of the things that, that we found is almost every time we do this, we get surprised by something. And so uh, what, where you try to plan on what data you want, and I think you need to be very uh, intentional, and there's a lot of planning that goes into the front end of this, is that there's always information that comes out of this that you don't expect to come out of this. And so when we're measuring things, uh, I think the analytics piece, we talk about data and analytics. And sometimes we feel like they're all one thing, but they're really not. The data, the collection of information on the front end is important, but equally important is being able to sit down and say, what does it mean? What are we looking at? What's this information? And if we drill down into some different uh, uh, ways of looking at this, how does it turn into actionable items that do those things that we talked about earlier, provide better customer service and safer environments for our folks? And uh, so I think there needs to be a significant portion of the, on the back end to look at those things. And uh, again, to the point there, we, we, we ask the questions, what do people know or what are you thinking? What are you doing and what does it mean? And so it's not just about measuring specific times and, and data points. It's also asking, what are your perceptions of things? What are you anticipating? How would you how do you think you would respond in certain incidents? And on the back end of these, we start we, when we start looking at the, the data, we're always surprised. I'll give you an example. We had a, a captain supervisory training. We had about 121 of our members who were getting ready to go through our captain's uh, uh, promotional process. And through that training, we captured over a thousand data points from them on what they were thinking. We gave them scenarios. We gave them uh, uh, they had to make decisions between different uh, possible scenarios. And in looking at that, one of the points that came out of this, there was dozens of them. But one thing that was very interesting that we didn't anticipate is these candidates were saying, I believe about 96 to 98 percent of them with with about four different questions. Says, I believe the company officer is the most influential person to make change within an organization. However, we also asked them to ask us questions back. And over half of those questions were, how do I influence people? How do I do this roving around as a new uh, acting out of class captain, as someone who doesn't have the experience? And so that was something that surprised us, but it allowed us to see, to have visibility to an issue that, that allowed us to focus in on the tasks of taking these young new members who are a little anxious about sitting in the right front seat. Um, and delivering them the tools that it takes that they were asking for. And so um, I think every every time we've built some of these uh, these drills out and collected information, um, if we would have, have only been looking at the information that we were looking for, you don't see this really important peripheral information. And so I think the analytics is really important to this as well. Yeah, I use the term operational intelligence to describe that, right? So data is nice, dashboarding is cool, but what does it mean? Yep. You know, like, so how, how do I change behavior or influence uh, tactics and operations in some meaningful way from this information? And I think that's that's what I was most impressed with looking uh, through the report and, and then talking to you guys at the exhibit hall about how that actually influenced the department downrange. Right. The, the outcome, the taking the data from the drill and then, uh, you know, looking at what the outcomes would be. So. Let, let's talk about some of the actual uh, things we learned. Like, so that just some of the big data points you had, just the stats going in, you had 244 units go through three scenarios 
uh, per day over 22 days, which incorporated uh, 1,004 members of the department. That's a massive drill, right? That, that's just to, to talk about the scope of, of what that was. And so I want to talk a little bit about just a couple of the, like the key data points. Like, uh, uh, let's see, I've got uh, time on air duration, air used, pounds per minute, time to roof. Uh, you looked at the at the differences in times uh, between the platform and the stick. Uh, t- tell me, tell me, like, what are your favorite uh, data points and key lessons that you took away from that? I'll, I'll tell you. I'll jump in real quick. So, a couple of the things that we wanted to look at as we were kind of deciding what to measure was um, we had just initiated a new two inch line. So, one of the things we wanted to see is let's try to measure. What, you know, let's track when guys are taking a inch and three quarter versus who's pulling a two. And so, Seth built that into the app. And then we track that time to see. We wanted to see, is it is the two-inch line much slower? Is it slowing guys down at all? Is there a big difference? Um, so that is one of the things that we built into the front front end of that. Um, the, also, we had just gotten two new platform ladders in our fleet. And so we knew that there would be coming. So that was where we came up with the, well, let's, let's compare the difference between a platform and a stick and see which one's going up faster. Is there much of a difference? Um, so we built that into that you know, to see what we could find there. Um, the time, time on air, um, you know, the important thing to note on that is that we only measured the lowest member members air when when coming out, because we go in as a crew, we come out as a crew based on, you know, who's going to be out of air. So we didn't, we didn't, so there are definitely some guys that would have had more, a few hundred pounds more of air, but we just, we just basically tagged it to the lowest, you know, person. So that average is there. But um, I think, uh, I mean, that's kind of some of the initial stuff from, from my point of view, and you guys can jump in too. Yeah, I, when you, I want to refer back to the, the, to the information that came out of this that we weren't really expecting. One of them that I thought was really important was that uh, when we looked on the, the, at the time on air, um, as we were analyzing it, we decided to overlay duration. And so that's how we started uh, to understand. It wasn't just a, you know, we were measuring low air readings when it comes out, but when we started coupling that with the amount of time that they were working, we were able to get a, 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 an indication of, based on that low air reading, how much are our, are our members that are working the hardest, how much air are they using per minute? And the benefit of that for us that was immediately actionable is that we have, uh, we, we found that it was a, the number we came up with was 255 pounds per minute for that low air reading. But if we look at the fact that we've got 4,500 PSI bottles, that showed us that that total time at that, at, at that consumption rate is a little over 17 minutes of total time uh, of working time. Well, our policy states that we need to be coming out of commercial buildings with a third of our air left in a reserve. So that means that we have 11 minutes of working time. And I hope that we can understand how that becomes immediately actionable to ICs on a fire ground. When we start talking about layering crews and work rest cycles, uh, understanding that 11 and a half minutes or so of working time in a commercial building is not a lot. And so early balancing to greater alarms and being able to, to layer crews and put crews in forward positions to relieve them. That was a really important piece that came out of this from a company officer and a command officer standpoint when it talks about immediately actionable um, um, IC decisions and command officer decisions uh, on the fire ground. So I thought that was a really cool piece of information too. Well, I, I want to, let's, let's look at that closer because if you're looking at 11 minutes of operational time, uh, how does that, I can walk that back to my effective response force, right? So to understanding what my operational response force needs to be at a structure fire. And then, then I'll, I'll change my, take my training hat off, my budget hat on and start walking back to the staffing and going, okay, do I have the staffing in place to be able to sustain a, a commercial st- structure fire based on that actual working time? So now we're not drawing stick figures on a, on a whiteboard and going, this, we need 16 people to do a structure fire. We're actually using real data, operational data based on our people. And you just can't argue with that from a, from a budget standpoint, right? Like talk about a strong case to make in the boardroom that this is, I can show you the data of how our people operate based on the people that are riding our fire trucks, working at our fires and doing the real work. And this is what it takes to, to operate safely. That really exposes a lot of uh, risk and opportunity, but, you know, both for 
what do you really, it's really easy to get out of, uh, to get out gunned in a structure fire if you don't have enough people. And it, it makes a strong case uh, downrange for finance and, and for staffing and, you know, long range budget planning. That's tremendous. Just that little data set. Look at what, look at what we're able to learn. And you start to see real quickly the power of data in organizations. This is where if you don't measure that, you would never know. You would never be able to make that decision. And the other piece that you, you kind of touch on in there is uh, we, we, um, we have a, a phrase here that says, if you apply standard actions to standard conditions, you get standard outcomes. Well, part of the the, the thing that gives all of us heartburn on fire incidents or on any incident are those variables. That's what we manage to. That's what we spend most of our time with. But when you start looking at even that one data point we were just talking about with air consumption, uh, it allows us to remove some of those variables, right? We, we, we now can anticipate better what our consumption rate is, what our, how long our crews can operate, how often we need to recycle them, how many crews we need to, to back in each sector or in each area. And so it allows us to work. And when we talked earlier about this, this true north, uh, firefighter safety, uh, being able to uh, address our tactical objectives in a more proficient way and ultimately customer service, that one data point allows all three of those to be more effective. And so you start seeing the power of what data and analytics within organizations can do. That is amazing. It, um, you know, it, it, it'll probably take me a couple of days to unpack the concept, <laughs> right? Just to sit and go, okay, how did these things trickle down range uh, through the various aspects of a, of a fire department? And that's just one data point. There was, um, I was talking to you, Chief, and he said the thing that, that really struck him was the separation from handline data point as yep. well. Talk about that a little bit. That was a huge one, and it, and it surprised us because, I mean, that, that's the whole impetus for this drill, right? I mean, the reason we wanted to do this drill was for our guys to get in. We were able to smoke this wire. We used, you know, our smokers, smoke this thing up, down to the ground. It was, it was pretty good, low visibility. Um, but working on hose line management, crew accountability, a captain maintaining accountability, and we preach in commercial buildings that, that you know, do not get off the hand line. So that was one that, uh, that surprised us that that many guys got off the line and were separated from their crew to the point where, you know, th they were would be lost in, in, in initiating a May Day. Um, so th that's uh, alarming, you know, and uh, one of our conversations about data and, and producing the end result of this data is just the honesty and integrity and transparency and, and being willing to just put that out there saying, yep, this is what happened, you know. So and I think that the value in that um, it, it gets more buy-in from our members and and it's just knowing that we're not trying to game we're not trying to hide that oh we don't want to we don't want to expose to the world the fact that this many guys got off of a hand line and got lost um and some people might say well it's only eight out of so many drills but we want that number to be zero you know so um so anyway yeah it, it's a huge deal and, and that was an eye-opener for us and, and and some of the one of the things we did is to get the um our SMEs, subject matter experts together after this and, and talk about kind of observable data, like, you know, things that we observed in training that we weren't necessarily data benchmarks on our data collection tool, but what did you guys see that made a difference? You know, let's talk about some uh, tactical things that guys did in there, some different techniques guys used, and we kind of put that together at the end. And, and some of those things um, I think were important to share with the, with the group overall. Um, and again, that goes back to, producing something at the end that, that is a conglomeration of all the lessons learned, all the data adds so much value for our members because the individual member on the micro level goes and he does the drill and he's going to have a certain amount of takeaways from, from their experience, right? And what, what that individual drill is. But now if you can produce this document and this summary of data at the end that shows this is where we were uh, everywhere with trends. Um, this is where we were as a department. We take that to the next level. We add a lot more value to that training. And we had a lot more, uh, you know, things that our guys can take away, maybe than much more than just their individual day that they went and did the drill. A, a lot of what he does is built around simulations for command training. And and I'll let him uh, continue to explain this a little more. But what these what these data points allow him to do is build real time. If you make an assignment now, you know, the time frame uh, based on that data based on the training information, based on, you know, how long a forcible entry takes. So, so now he can 
try to build the simulations in a more realistic manner, which which I think is a very cool um, you know product of what this data collection does. How long does it take if you if you assign somebody to the roof? Well, in a simulation world, you might get them to the roof. You might get a roof report in two minutes. Well, that's not usually very very realistic, right? Or you might send somebody to the rear of a building to force entry on, a, on the rear of, a, of, a, of a, a door that's not supposed to be entered from the outside, and you get them in three minutes. That's not a that's not realistic. So, so uh, Chief, you want to uh, go ahead and explain that a little bit further? Yeah, just to, I mean, I, I thought you did a pretty good job with that, Seth. But um, just to, it allows us, you know, that that's always been one of the the difficulties is um, the, the term out there, training scars. Is if we train the wrong way, it's going to reinforce maybe some 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 issues that we don't want to reinforce. It's going to if we train in an unrealistic way, and in the simulated world, that's uh, our heartburn is trying to make make this as realistic as we possibly can. And so a a really cool part of the, of pulling in data is allowing us to see that and reinforce decisions, tactical decisions with our company and command officers that mirror the real world. And so if we're in a commercial building and we've measured the time that it takes to lay 300 feet of supply line, pull tools forward, force a door, and, and we want to make that assignment around back, which characteristically we know the, the back side of commercial buildings are a lot harder to get into than the front, then we need to be able to reinforce the time frame and the heartache that that's going to cause on scene and then have the discussion about would it be you know possibly better on the front end of these to find easier access points to get more information quick. And so it allows us the, the ability to drive decision making and drive conversations and teaching points within um, within our organization that I think reinforce better decision making, more accurate decision making. But it's all based on on this data that we can pull from 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 real life scenes. So. You guys have mentioned that you mentioned the dashboard. Were, were companies able to see the real time progress as this as this drill unfolded over the weeks? No, uh, no. But I think Seth can speak to this because he's kind of the designer of the dashboards, and that is something that we'll, would be capable of in, on future, you know, drills like this. Yeah, absolutely. So this one, this like. We were saying this was our first kind of, you know, attempt to to build something like this and to collect information. So we had real no organized way to understand what the effect would be. Um, but now going forward with our next department wide training, which is coming up here very shortly, what our plan is or it's going to happen uh, is we've created a dashboard that that members can go to and see that real time update. Um, and see how they're, they're, how they did on that drill, how others are doing on the drill, what, what their impact at that one part of the incident of that drill um, had, you know, compared to, the, you know, to evaluate themselves, to evaluate the overall performance. Um, so, yes, to answer your question, the, the going forward, it will be real time. That one did not have real time data, um, but everything in the future will. Well, I mean, I could see it either way, right? So there might be situations where sharing that information is useful to the to the intent of the drill. I could also see where not sharing that information could be useful to the intent of the drill. This depends on what you're trying to do. Yeah, we uh, we did one years ago in our department, very rudimentary back in the day, but we we purposefully didn't tell anybody what was going to happen because it was kind of a surprise, right? You know, so I I can understand uh, how that would work. Now, one of the things I wanted to that re we really kicked around hard in the convention hall that day was uh, closing the gap or closing the narrowing the the response gap, right? So, we a lot of times in data we focus on the average of the performance, whatever it is. But you had people that performed really well, and you had people that performed sub-average uh, that had opportunity to improve. Tell us about how you guys work with those data points. I think Jason had that conversation with you and he's got, we've talked about that exact thing and he's got a great um, kind of a, a introduction to that. Um, so, Let it rock, Jason. Yeah. So um, we, we kind of call it narrowing the spread. And I think when we, you start looking at data and analytics, there's a lot of different ways that we can look at it. And, and this speaks to the importance of collecting good information on the front end, but really that analysis piece. And so, um, if you were to take, let's, let's, let's create a scenario here for a second where 
you've got, let's measure from the parking brake, taking a full crew, moving them forward to a forced entry prop and seeing what time it takes. This is our imaginary drill. We want to measure the time that it gets through there uh, for them to get through that prop. So let's say that we measure a number of 30, 40 crews and the average is four minutes. Well, one way of looking at that is, well, four minutes is pretty good. That gives us some actionable items and that allows us some, some visibility on our, uh, on our crews and how we can make better decisions. But what we did is we started looking at this spread. Uh, for those folks that are out there who are listening or watching this, imagine, if you will, a line, a timeline, where on the far left is zero and on the far right is maybe 10 minutes. And if you take those 30 or 40 crews and you start placing them along that timeline, you realize that for a four minute average where there's crews that got through that in a minute and other crews that it took them eight minutes to get through. Uh, the question is how important is an average of four minutes if the spread is over six or seven minutes, if the, devi the, the, the area of deviation is over six minutes. Now think if you will, the same average but, but all of those crews or the majority of those crews are clustered between three and five minutes. Same average, but a very different spread. And what we found is that when we started looking at our data, we found that we had a, this wide spread. It spoke to consistency more than proficiency, right? And this is huge when it comes to uh, training applications, because if we want to try to train to proficiency, that training plan is going to be very different than if we want to train to consistency. And so when we start looking at these wide spreads, we put together training in an effort to narrow those spreads, to build consistency within, within an organization, because we just can't, uh, it's very difficult to have actionable information from inconsistent data. And so what's really cool is that we were able to take that, th that inconsistent piece that's visibility now that we would never have known if we didn't measure it and we train to it. And what that might look like for this imaginary incident is we would maybe uh, look at the anatomy and physiology of forced entry tools. Let's teach our members a little bit more about the details of what, the, what are all the different parts of a halogen and how do we use them and, a, and flathead versus pickhead axes and pry tools. And then let's look at, at how we fail different mechanisms within doors, whether it's panic hardware, or reinforced, you know, interior versus exterior swinging doors. And you can train to certain coordinated techniques versus training to just speed and, and efficiency. And now what we do is we start narrowing the gap, narrowing that spread, and we build consistency. That, so the training changes when we start seeing those things. Now the goal is to build consistency before we build proficiency. The, 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 the important takeaway of this is there's no way of knowing without measuring it on the front end being really committed to how we analyze that information. And here's what's a, another really key piece of that is, uh, which I think many people out there when we look at data and analytics miss, is we have to retest it. We have to see, did the training work? And so what we do then is, is we train to it and then we want to look at it again. Let's test it again at another incident and let's see if we narrow the gap. Because if we, if we did, a, our training works, and now we can move towards training to proficiency. But if, if we re, reanalyze this and we find that maybe our training didn't work as well as we thought, then we need to revamp that training tool. So th this can only, and this is the really cool thing about it. Again, the power of, of harnessing data and analytics is you can't know this without capturing data, without analyzing it, and without training to it and then testing it. And so that's, that's what's been another thing that's really cool in the training world here is being able to look at that whole evolution and watch watch it work and, and, and see how it changes our tactics around training and our strategies around delivering training. One of the cool things too that we saw with this, with that particular measurable is after that drill, we had a bunch of requests for blue doors. Well, that's one of the training props that we used was a blue door. And, and we had fire districts calling saying, hey, can we get a blue door? We want to train more because they, you know, our crews immediately recognized if they struggled a little bit. We put out the data, just raw data. It didn't say which engine company, who. It just showed that spread. And so those guys know where they were on there. And they know if they weren't that fastest crew. And, and they were kind of self-motivated to be like, all right, we need to pick up our game a little bit and do some more training and, you know, work on our forcible entry. So that was cool to see. And that, my friends, is a fire training masterclass. <laughs> just that little section right there. That I mean... That is such a powerful uh, piece of information for any fire trainer in the world is to understand how to 
how do you collect that data? What do you do with it? And then how do you take that and, and have follow up training to improve and close the spread, as you say, uh, that that's just absolutely brilliant. I'm absolutely so amazing. I might have to go take a break and just, you know, recover from that because it was just that, that was good. That was really good. Um, holy smokes. Well, what else? Um, I, I will share this. I, I, so we were talking at the conference. I went, it made me remember a drill we did a while back and we are nowhere near as advanced. This is from years ago, but we found out right when the uh, survival training had recently occurred, you know, when May Day became a thing right back, however long that was. Um, we ran our people through all the training initially, and then we ran them through a scenario to see what the outcome would be. How did it stick? And we found out, let me see. Um, we found that only 61% transmitted a mayday. So that was awful. Right. We just we just trained everybody on how to on, on what Mayday is and, and what to do when when you're in trouble. And only 61 percent transmitted a Mayday. I was, what? You know, so that that's just a a, a low tech, you know, version of, 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 of a similar lesson. Right. And we also the other thing I went back and read that report. Uh, we had 23 percent of our people misread the coupling on exit on exit. Mm. Something as basic as that, man, just finding a coupling and, and you know, Knowing how to read that thing with gloves on. Uh, all the, it, it, my point is that any fire department listening to this show can do the things that we're talking about. It doesn't require you don't have to you don't have to be you know a big fire department, big you know metro fire department. You don't have to have a lot of tools. You don't have to have a lot of tech. You just got to have a lot of passion about what you do. And and all these things can be accomplished. I think pretty easily. Yeah. What um what's next? Tell me what's where is Phoenix going uh, from here? Uh, well, so I would say um, a lot of stuff that Seth and Jason do at our command training center, um, they started to initiate a lot of information gatherings, pr- surveying our, our troops before we bring them down for training. And that has allowed us to gain knowledge before we run them through training, which is valuable because now you can start looking at what are they thinking about certain things, whatever the topic is prior to and that, that that enables us to kind of target our training a little bit more like you know if we get that information on the front end and jason can share a lot of this these guys are working on this all the time um jump in on that jason because i think that's one of the the coolest things that we're starting to do at command training yeah i think um part of to answer that and on a bigger scale and i'll drill down on that a second is looking at the evolution of this because one of the things that you start finding when you <clears throat> when you build this training is that there's there's a cyclical approach to it, similar to what we just talked about, where you find, you gather data, you analyze it, you train to it, you, and then you gather more data and you validate that. So what we're in the process now, we've done this a number of times, is we're in that validation process, we're in the trending process, where we start looking at how are our, how, how is our uh, the trends in training uh, affecting our crews, and also uh, trying to pull data on real time incidents. I think it was pretty cool during the even during the cold uh, the big box commercial drill. As we were gathering data, we were actually using that data to change the way we train in real time. And we were able to, from events, we're a pretty large organization, there were events happening and we could pull information from the events to see, are we making a difference? And so I think what what you start realizing is this becomes very layered. And uh, we didn't speak a lot to, uh, because it's a little difficult, it's it's a little bit like nailing jello to the wall, but um, is, is capturing what people are thinking. And it's so important for us to understand what are our firefighters, our, our engineers or, or driver operators and our company officers and then ICs thinking before we go into this, are they acting in a way or the behaviors mimicking what they tell us and what's the outcome of those things? And so that's really the, the sum of where the direction of our training is going is to looking at how are all those things aligned with each other and then and then what is, what's the trend line between what we measured previously and what we're measuring now? And are we trending in the direction that we want to trend? Uh, and so I think there becomes this ongoing, uh, we call it an ecosystem, Seth and I, it's this, it's this training ecosystem that's built around an evolving and, 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 and moving scene. Another thing that was pretty cool, and I, I want to speak to how gathering data in real time allows you to 
to, to actually change training as it's happening, we, um, we kind of layer our training model in terms of, uh, we start typically with some, our BCs and our deputy chiefs. Uh, we do tactical training with them around a topic. So we did it with our big box cold smoke. Our next rollout is going to be around search and rescue. Uh, and then we move to captain's tactical training where we bring them down to a facility like this. We do a lot of simulated training. We have crews and we bring an entire crew in. We do, uh, we do classroom training and some hands-on training around that. And then we build out a large scale event. And so all of the information we're gathering along the way helps us understand and get insight into how we need to continue to tweak training. So by the by the time we're three, four, five months down the road and we're interacting with crews and interacting with captains in their tactical training and interacting with crews doing hands on drills, we've changed our training. We now have insight that we didn't have before that allows us to guide and sort of in real time. Uh, mutate our training to better fit the needs that we're finding out. So that really that evolution and that sort of ecosystem is what we're beginning to build now. And it's it's been really fun. So, Seth, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit, too. Which part of it? <laughs> oh, just the, the future, uh, of how they how those the layers of that all fit together. I know I, I don't know if you have anything to add. I know we've spoken about that a lot. Um, but it's really insightful, you know, just to, to how you see the, 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 the layering of this data and the trending of the data over time, how that matters and how it changes the way we do things. Yeah, I would say that's the benefit to having the tools um, available to us is that as, as the information gets gathered, you can start to see those, those results and compare them to other points of information within that drill or that training environment and see how one may affect the other one. Where unfortunately, when you do it with paper or, or you don't have, I guess, these, these robust tools, you might not be able to find those effects as well. Where with this system that we've put together, we can, we can apply different variables and see how they're affected by another variable instantaneously, basically. And so if you, 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 click on one variable, it'll, it'll filter down and show how it affects something that maybe you didn't even think it could affect. And then that allows you to change the training or change, you know, pivot the way that you're doing things to, to uh, um, going forward. Uh, so that is, that is one piece of it that is very beneficial to having this environment that we have is that real-time result and real-time effect that you're going that you can analyze. Um, so, so although anybody can do these types of analysis and data collection, the more you invest in this training environment, you know, analysis and data collection, the better result you'll be and the better the data if, if you if you have the effort put forward for it, will provide you details and insight to what you're doing. Um, so I don't want to under undervalue that part of it also, because uh, that's really the benefit that we get is Every morning we can show up and we can say, hey, how did this affect this? Let's look at this. Let's add this and see how this one little change affected everything else, which we have done recently. I'll speak one to of that, the too, just the stacking of the training that we did, because that was intentionally, you know, a lot of times in the past we would have, say, command training is focusing on this topic over here. And the department drill might focus on a certain topic and then captain's tacticals is doing something different. And we made a conscious decision to let's stack this training and, and kind of run it from the strategic tactical task levels all the way through and, and on the same theme. And like these guys said, it really helped us identify some things that we were able to then on the fly kind of address, tweak our training or, or tailor it to certain things that we recognize needed to be addressed. And I think that that was really successful and it kind of gave us some some continuity and all the things we were doing through all levels of the department. And, and, and it really created a lot of buy in. A lot of folks were, you know, because we're doing it at multiple levels and then you're reinforcing things multiple times. And it really kind of uh, just drives the training experience, whatever the topic is, I think, to another level. Are you really looking at I mean, this we're basically describing the basics. The basis of fire training going forward for the next foreseeable future. I mean, we, we've, we've always been kind of a trial and error sort of uh, tactics development sort of industry. Uh, now we're becoming more of an evidence-based uh, operationally functioning fire service. 
and and I think that will only continue as as the technology increases, um, as as we see the ability to even bring some machine learning and some, you know, I hate to use the word, but AI into the, into, yeah. into some of this uh, these capabilities. It's going to be pretty interesting to see what we can do from a training perspective. I see a lot of uh, a lot of different companies now at these shows that I attend all the time are really grappling with with virtual reality and and how can we leverage technology in that way. Um, this all informs that, mm -hmm. right? So we would, have, how fast should a, a truck company operate? Well, we, until now, we've never really had the data to under, understand what that looks like. Now, now through your work, we're starting to be able to appreciate that. I got to ask for the nozzle heads listening though, how did the two inch stack up against the instant three quarter? <laughs> what, what was the, what was the deal there? Seth, do you have that data? I mean, so the, the, the time, it wasn't as much as we thought. Um, the, the two inch line was a little bit slower. Um, and I'd have to look at the chart to see the exact time. Um, yeah, something that I, but, to speak to while you're looking at that, Wes, the, the, this was one where it challenged some assumptions. And we had a lot, we were just rolling this thing out. And so there was a lot of conversation within our department, sometimes pretty animated conversation about, you know, anytime something new gets rolled out. Um, but it challenged, it did, some of the numbers challenged some assumptions that all of us had, myself included, where you have to look at it and say, oh, okay, well, I, I, I thought it would be different. And so now what do we do moving forward? Um, and one of those that challenged my assumption was the, it didn't really take more air per minute to move this around. It, it, it wasn't, yeah. um, guys weren't burning through more air necessarily to move it, but it was a little slower. But Wes, you want to speak to the numbers? Yeah. So that the inch and three quarter line was about an, on average a minute faster, roughly. So, you know, significant minutes matter, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, we say, well, a minute difference, um, but they did use more air because of the extra minute. So like Jason said, the, the, the min pounds per minute didn't really change, but because they're in there for an extra minute, burning 200, that's 255 more pounds of air that, you know, that based on our numbers. Um, so that was the correlation really. And that, and that, you know, would be expected, I guess, with a heavier line, a little bit bigger line, that's going to slow guys down a little bit. So. And I think, again, when we talk about actionable information, this was in a commercial building, a large big box building. So we wanted to look at the difference of that. But that gives us really good insight into when is it appropriate to use either line? If I know it's going to be a little slower, I'll still have the same working time on it because it's not burning more air, but I'm bringing more water. We, we can understand the applications that works in. There's other applications where I need more agility. I want to be able to move. I want to get to the end of this line quicker get in faster um, and and maybe the, the the smaller line would be more appropriate for that. So when we measure these things, it gives us that information to be able to make more informed choices. I mean, we're just starting to understand with the uh, FSRI training or research, how much water do we need? I mean, that's that's still a, you know, that, that that's still a work in progress uh, from a water supply aspect even. Uh, you know, they're, they're controlling a big fire with little water when a pl water applied is applied appropriately. So there's still more to learn there too. So, so we're going to, um, I know, I know folks will ask, where can I get this report? And uh, what we're going to do is try to make it available on a forward facing page and put it in the description. So if, if you look down on the description of the show, uh, you'll be able to hopefully see that report. It is very enlightening uh, and very well done. The data is presented in a very clear way and uh, it's firefighter friendly for the for the read there. So it's it's a uh, very very useful information. Anything to uh, add, guys, before we start to wrap up? No, I'll just say you know th thanks for the opportunity to share this. Uh, we you know we really hope that uh, other fire departments can take this, learn from it, go out and find ways to collect their own data, measure things that matter to them, and you know find ways to add value to what they're doing. And again, it goes back to you know at the end of the day, it's, it's improving our customer service and firefighter safety and efficiency. And, um, so yeah, we, we just, you know, please reach out to us if we can answer any questions or help in any way. Uh, we're more than willing to do that, but thank you. Well, I'm excited to see, uh, Phoenix leading the way in this, in this effort with, you know, with fire training and data collection and a whole bunch of other stuff too. This is just one of the, one of the aspects we're focused on. Uh, but I, I will say this, if you're listening to this show and you're not in the training division, you want to share this with your training division. I think this should be a must listen for anybody that's involved in fire training across the country or the world, because there are some really 
really strong nuggets of information of what you can do to improve your training program, particularly related to in-service training, which is something that we we tend to struggle with, you know, as a fire service. So brilliant work. I commend everybody involved in that. Absolutely. I'm in awe of it. Still in awe. We've been talking about it for a couple of months now and I'm still (laughs) rattling on about it. So it's uh, I appreciate you you guys taking the the opportunity and the time to sit with us for a few minutes today and and share this information. It's going to be really valuable for a lot of folks across the fire service. So I, I humbly thank you for that. And that's a wrap for this uh, episode of the Fire Service Data and Tech Talk. You can find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook page, Fire Service Data and Tech Talk. We're also on Twitter at Data Tech Talk there. And you can find me on LinkedIn over at Eddie Buchanan. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this episode. We'll see you next time on Fire Engineering. Everybody stay safe. Fire Service Data and Tech Talk.